So BRC's, uh, one of BRC's permanent supportive housing programs, our, our newest congregate program is at 902 Liberty Avenue in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, we call it Liberty Homes, and it was designed by Hardin and Van Arnen uh, Associates and built by Artec, and it's a tax credit building our syndicators, Richmond, uh, who's downstairs. There are 46 units plus a live-in super um, in this program. There are 31 studios for formerly homeless single adults with disabling conditions, and that meets HUD's requirement of a disabling condition. We also have eight one-bedroom units, and five of those are designated for homeless couples, and th uh, three of those are designated for community couples and seven two-bedroom apartments. Those are all community families, and for our community, it's community boards four and five, um, which is the East New York area. The program was funded through tax credit and home monies. Uh, we are 100% project-based Section 8 uh, through HPD, and we also have a supportive services contract through HUD. Construction was completed in October, and because of tax credit guidelines, we needed to be 100% fully occupied in about six weeks um, in 2010. And we did it despite Mother Nature throwing us a couple of snowstorms that year. Um, and so literally our executive director in his uh, Jeep four-wheel drive was going out to East New York and picking up our last community resident who was eight and a half months pregnant mm -hmm. to get her to the briefing date <laughs> so that she could move in and we could get tax credit money. Um, so it all worked out well, and I think uh, I'll speak to this, but I think that helped um, the sense of community being developed um, as we were ramping up Liberty. Um, since those initial movements, we've had two folks move out, um, one a community family and one a single adult, and we've had um, two new intakes. Our model was really created because of um, the various funding sources. When BRC started out, we were looking at housing that can meet the needs of our currently homeless folks. BRC um, operates a number of homeless shelters and safe havens and transitional housing programs that are, are licensed through OMH. Um, and so the original vision was to house um, single adults who needed some support, but were also really <laughs> employable. Um, so kind of a, a general pop model, um, we were having difficulty identifying resources that existed within the system to meet the needs of these folks. Um, but through the different layers of funding, right, people give you money and then there's expectations about what you do with that money. Um, there was there were negotiations about um, having it not just be studios, but to add one and two bedroom units into the program um, and to designate some of those units to be community units. Um, and so as we, as the project was being built and designed and as we were getting close to um, screening for folks, um, BRC tried to morph all of those sometimes contradictory funder requirements um, uh, to design the program model that we were able to implement. So there are 46 units total. We currently have 74 tenants. Um, there have been three babies born in the last two and a half years um, at Liberty, so our, our tenancy numbers <laughs> tend to change, um, which, which has been fun. And we, we have a focus on the common spaces within uh, the building being appropriate to the size and the makeup of our tenancy. Um, so we have little kids, we have older folks, we have lots of folks in between. Um, and also just being mindful of working to fill the gaps of services that are in the community. Um, some of you may know East New York is not the richest neighborhood in terms of resources. Um, and so being able to offer a backyard that is a safe place for families and singles alike to spend time, um, not have to worry about what's going on in the neighborhood um, over, over the years, usually in the summer, there's notable gang activity um, that we would like our folks to not join in. And having a computer lab where um, our children who are in school can go to do their homework, where adults can go to do their job search, and where also folks can just connect with um, other people in their lives on Facebook. Um, or, you know, kind of, we, we have one woman who is pursuing a career with Avon, and so being able to be online and have access to that um, in a safe place, a quiet place, a dedicated place, was very meaningful. 
So creating a comfortable environment has um, been a main focus, and a lot of this was, was developed during the design of the building. Um, there are few barriers um, or dividers, um, especially on the ground floor of the building as a, a three-story building. Um, so our foyer, um, which you can see, all natural light, all open glass. Our front desk staff aren't behind any doors or windows or walls. Um, it's just it's, it's an open desk um, for folks to connect with each other. Um, and then that initial foyer leads into a larger community area on the first floor um, that has taken on a number of uses um, depending on what's going on. So um, at times it is where we signed all the leases when we were originally ramping up. Um, it's also where our kids do arts and crafts um, when they come home from school and we have little kid-sized tables. Um, for, for all that to happen. It's where people, our tenants, come and connect with each other after work, um, as, as anyone would do kind of in, in their home. Case management doesn't often start in the case management offices. In fact, uh, that's kind of a sure way to um, kill case management. <laughs> if you're, come with me to my office and, and let's work on stuff. But really it's about staff testing some of their assumptions about how we need to connect with folks and how we should connect with folks um, to engage in offering services. And this is true both for our community residents and our formerly homeless residents. We don't separate how we provide services to any of the folks that live in, in the building. So creating that sense of community when we have such uh, a diverse group of folks who were initially moving in began with being very transparent about the program type during the interview process. We didn't want anybody, especially those folks who were coming from the community, to be surprised that this was supportive housing and to try and have an understanding of what supportive housing meant that there would be staff um, on 24-7 at the front desk, there would be case management staff seven days a week, and although we worked to try and explain this during the interview and move-in process, a lot of the folks who were coming to us from the community had never really connected with social service providers before and didn't really understand what we meant by case management staff and what those services um, might look like for them on site. Um, of the 10 units that we have for folks who came from the community, four of them actually meet the disabling condition requirement that all of our homeless units do also. And so what we found is although those folks weren't necessarily identified as needing services upon intake, everybody's been able to benefit from being within the supportive housing model. Also, the unit configuration models kind of a traditional market rate housing. We have studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms, and as we talked about before, that's just kind of a, a natural normalizing feel, and it provides an opportunity for there to be intergenerational support, um, diversity in terms of people's backgrounds and experiences, um, culture and religion, all that good stuff that goes into creating um, a sense of community. Our condensed move-in period did create a bonding experience for all of our initial tenants. Folks moved in essentially between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, um, and it was winter, and everybody was coming essentially to a community that they weren't familiar with. Um, and so it was a lot of, hey, let, let's walk around the neighborhood, let's find the best grocery store. Um, where's the PA office? Because we all just <laughs> moved here and our cases are getting transferred. And so there was a great opportunity amongst the tenants, but also with the staff to really partner in learning and experiencing their new homes. As I mentioned, uh, there's really no difference in service provision uh, across the kind of the, the homeless versus community units that we have. Um, we offer a very fluid approach to service provision, um, very strengths-based and client-centered. Um, and so it really is about understanding what struggles folks may be having and working to offer supports in a way that our tenants are, are willing and open to receiving those supports. So it's often by noticing who comes in with groceries that week or who doesn't have their normal grocery bag with them that we figure out maybe somebody's hours got reduced and they're not having enough money to buy food and so how can we help them um, kind of uh, supplement um, for that time or maybe problem solve around the hours or maybe we need to negotiate a rent reduction with Section 8 that has a bigger impact. All of that we learn by, by being in those open community areas. If our staff were 
kind of hidden behind closed doors in the case management section of the building, we wouldn't have an understanding of what was going on with our folks and therefore be able to provide those supportive services in a really accessible and non-judgmental way. Um, and our programming, diverse and engaging programming has been key. Um, we have focused on opportunities for tenants of all ages. And what we found is that having children in the building has such a Im huge impact on how everybody interacts. Um, the parents are comfortable and have gained comfort um, over the time living there that there's kind of a uh, community parenting approach in a way. So anybody sees a kid running down the hall and about to do something that they shouldn't be doing, anybody has that level of comfort to address the child um, appropriately. Um, when folks first moved in, again, it, it was winter, there wasn't a whole lot to do in the community in East New York, but we had this great backyard and lots of snow. And so what we found is that the kids would want to go out and build snowmen um, and other things. And interestingly, a lot of our formerly homeless single men would, in an appropriate, non-creepy way, <laughs> which is important, um, go out and help the kids build the snowmen. And that was a really neat bonding opportunity for, for folks to come together as neighbors, as part of this new community, um, and, and to kind of break down some barriers and maybe some assumptions. What we found is that the tenants quickly developed ownership of the building. It was brand new, they were the first folks that moved in, that created a whole lot of excitement. Um, and they really wanted to use the space um, and to have it be their own. So we do lots of holiday celebrations, we do lots of arts and crafts. Um, with the kids, and interestingly, a lot of those formerly homeless single adult men are right there with the arts and crafts projects. And I think it, it creates an opportunity for maybe them to have um, renegotiated opportunities to kind of parent a child that maybe they missed out on opportunities to parent their own children. Um, and so this is a way to kind of work through some of that in a, in a positive, um, healthy way for both them and, and the children. Oftentimes our tenants will ask to use the community room for birthday celebrations or kind of family get-togethers and all that has been great. We've um, had talk of having our first wedding um, at Liberty. <laughs> One of our single tenants is currently engaged and so he is exploring using the space for that. Uh, we have a lot of game nights, and in a lot of ways, the we um, has really brought our folks together. <laughs> it's kind of surprising, but the power of we um, has, has been quite huge. Um, so watching, again, the little kids get, get those adults to do Let's Dance and bowling um, creates these really just beautiful, powerfully positive opportunities for, for folks to connect.